Hey everyone and welcome to the Spring Boot Crash Course, the best online resource you need to learn Spring Boot from scratch and become a better software engineer. Spring Boot framework is used by many big tech companies to build their microservices architectures and large-scale backend systems because it helps you to build highly performant production-grade applications while keeping your code base scalable. Having Spring Boot in your skill set will allow you to become more competitive in the job market and is definitely a required technology to master on your way to becoming a senior backend software engineer. In this one-hour course, we're going to build from scratch a REST API using Spring Boot that communicates with an external API via HTTP but also with a local MySQL database to store some user data. The goal of this course is to show you how Spring Boot works in an end-to-end -end application with a functionality similar to a microservice, and hopefully this will give you that powerful start in your journey of becoming a Spring Boot master. The only requirements for this course is to have IntelliJ IDEA installed, basic Java knowledge, and of course, a strong desire to learn new technologies. So with that, let's jump into the first lecture of this course. Hey everyone and welcome back. So before we dive into the actual code, let's take a moment and understand why do we need to learn Spring Boot Framework. And right here we are on the official website of Spring Boot. And if we click on the overview, we can see a number of um, advantages of this framework, which are actually validated by the industry. I mean, they are added right here on the, on the website, but the popularity of this framework actually says something about um, whether those advantages are actually uh, true or not, right? So first of all, is about the popularity, right? But the reason it's, it's so popular is because it's very flexible and uh, it allows you to build production grade apps really fast. We're going to see further in this course that Spring Boot is really easy to configure, whether using annotations or configuration files. And it's also important to mention the landscape of applications where Spring Boot can be used. So you can use it to build microservices, which is kind of the, the new trend nowadays pretty much any big company has this microservice architecture in some part of their infrastructure. And Spring Boot has actually full support for this, mostly if you use the Spring Cloud and uh, all the cloud capabilities that uh, Spring Cloud actually offers. Um, but apart from that, you can also build reactive applications and event-driven applications. So it kind of integrates with uh, pretty much all the new stuff that's going on out there. So in other words, if you know how Spring works, you, you kind of have an, uh, an advantage in this uh, software engineering world as of today, right? So there are a number of clips and documentation on the internet that you can actually follow if you want to see an overview or uh, how Spring actually works. A lot of people are actually using it, so there's plenty of documentation on the internet. And the main role of this course is to enable you to use Spring Boot really fast, right? So we're not going to, to dive into all the small details of Spring Boot, we're just going to start right away and get going with uh, the main uh, capabilities of uh, Spring Boot, right? I'm going to assume that you kind of know object-oriented programming and how uh, things work in that space. I mean, classes, interfaces, methods, and things like that. So basic Java knowledge. And then we're going to build on top of that with uh, the capabilities of Spring Boot framework. So enough talking, let's see some code, right? If you want to build your first um, Spring Boot application, we got uh, two options. The first one is to use this Spring Initializer uh, website which you can access at star.spring.io. And this website allows you to create um, a pre-configured Spring Boot application. You just have to click around, select your project, your language, your Spring Boot version, and complete uh, your project name, artifact group, and uh, things like that, including the Java version. And when you click on generate, you're going to see that uh, you, the browser will download an archive with, uh, with a project, an IntelliJ IDEA project, that contains um, a, a simple Hello World application with Spring Boot uh, pre-configured. This is, of course, the easy path, but we're not going to go on that route. Instead, we're going to start from a clean IntelliJ IDEA project, and we're going to uh, add uh, what's required in terms of uh, Spring dependencies to see how it actually works. So right here, I have the IntelliJ IDEA Community Edition. I'm going to click on New Project. I'm going to say Spring Boot Course. I'm going to select Java as a language, Gradle as a build system. I'm going to use Java 17. And right here, I'm going to say java.spring.course, right? I'm going to hit create, and we're going to wait for Gradle to get refreshed, right? To download all the initial dependencies. And this is our first project. Now, we're going to go back on the web and search for Spring Boot Starter Web Maven Central. 
Maven Central is of course the main repository for uh, JVM based dependencies. We're going to search for this dependency it's called Spring Boot Starter Web. This one is kind of a slim dependency which includes pretty much all the things we need to create a very basic uh, Spring Boot application. We're going to click on the latest version and select Gradle and we're going to copy this right on our build.gradle file under the dependencies section, right? I'm going to paste it here and then hit Gradle refresh and then uh, we, we can see that uh, it got downloaded properly. Now I'm going to get back on the main class and right here on the uh, class level, I'm going to annotate it with Spring Boot application. This annotation comes from of course the Spring Boot framework and identifies the entry point for our uh, Spring Boot application. And in the body of the main class, we're going to say Spring application dot run. And right here, we're going to provide uh, the main dot class object. So this is a this is the identifier for the main class where the Spring Boot annotation is located. And then we're going to provide the arguments that were uh, provided on the main method. So what this line actually does is to start the actual framework. It's basically a blocking instruction. So the application, the process, the JVM process will not exit until the application is killed or until, uh, you know, it gets the, the process gets um, terminated in some way. Right. So any Spring application, I mean, any web server actually should be long running because it should accept continuously connections right from uh, HTTP clients. So when we click on run, we're going to see in the logs this output. So you can see this nice art saying uh, spring as well as the spring version. And on the logs, we can see that we got here the, um, the logs from Tomcat web server. We can see the port on which the application is running and we can see that it started successfully. So in other words, Tomcat is basically a, a web server which comes with Spring Boot. So you can also install it independently, right? Um, it's built by the Apache community and it's basically a classical web server, just uh, accepts connections, uh, follows the HTTP protocol and all the stuff. The main reason it, it was uh, embedded into the framework, I believe, is because uh, uh, it's very lightweight. So it, it doesn't consume too much memory and too much, uh, too many resources. Um, and probably this was the reason it was chosen to be part of, uh, of the Spring Boot framework. I believe you can also change it if you want with Apache or Ktor or other uh, web servers. This is how it works in the, in the default version, right? Right. So this is how our first Spring Boot application actually works. Um, currently the application doesn't do anything. It just uh, accepts connections on uh, 8080. But uh, if we go on our browser and say localhost, local, so let's say local host 8080. And we just click on it. We can see that we don't have anything. This error actually comes from uh, Spring Boot or from Tomcat, I believe, because it, it needs to, to find some, some paths to map the request. And on the default path, it doesn't have anything to map to. So currently our application just runs and, but uh, we haven't specified any kind of action to be executed on a particular interaction, right? So this is currently the, the state, right? We, we just have an application that doesn't do anything. So how do we tell to this application that uh, it needs to, to do a specific action when the clients are interacting with it in a specific way, right? So for that reason, we're going to uh, create a class which is called a controller, a REST controller. And we're going to uh, put that class into a dedicated package called controllers, right? So I just created a package and then I'm going to uh, call this user controller. So in a Spring Boot application, a controller is the first entry point for a request in the application. So when the clients are, are making a request that needs to, to hit the application, usually it will hit a controller first. And then based on the logic defining the controller, the request will get propagated in other components as we'll see further in this course. So to, to make you an idea on how a controller works, let's uh, create a, a method here called public void, uh, actually public string get user. Uh, so this method is a, is a very simple classical method. It just returns uh, something like user John Doe, right? Just returns a string. And very important, this method will be annotated with get mapping followed by get user. Right here, we can have any kind of string which actually should start with a forward slash because it needs to have a path like uh, structure. So what this annotation actually does is to 
create a path or a route in our application. So when, when a client, either a browser or, or any HTTP client is going to call that path, this method will be called right inside our application, right? So th this is how it, it actually works. Now let's rerun our application in order for those changes to take effect. And we're going to hit enter on this one, right? So as you can see here, we got this string back, right? Now, if we click on inspect to see the actual request, if we go also on the network tab and hit refresh, we can see that the browser actually launched this HTTP GET request on that URL, on localhost 8080 GET user. So the browser by default, when you refresh any page, it makes this GET request. Actually, it makes, actually it initially makes this GET request and then it can download some, some JavaScript back, which then gets executed by the browser, which then can launch other requests and so on. So this in, in practice, this is uh, even more complex. But in this very simple use case, the browser just launched the GET request on which actually hit our uh, API, which returned this uh, string object. So this is how you get data back from our uh, API. Now, if we just click here, if we click here on the response, we can see our string payload. And if we click here back on the headers, we can see that on the response headers, we also got this information here. Those headers were actually uh, added by the framework, right? So we didn't have, we didn't do anything uh, to for that data to show up here. Um, and those are the request headers. And by, by the way, a header is just a key value uh, type of information entry, right? Um, and this is what the browser, the Chrome actually added on, on the request uh, to our uh, application. Now, of course, we can change those headers um, by using the Spring Boot uh, mechanisms. But a very important thing to note is that their structure, the name, the key name of the headers and uh, the values are actually regulated by the HTTP protocol. So the HTTP protocol, uh, and by the way, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Um, hypertext actually refers to um, HTML, but um, it's more of a legacy naming because you can actually transfer binary data uh, using HTTP. So HTTP has a number of rules, right? Any protocol basically has a number of rules which governs some kind of action. In this case, HTTP governs the, the communication between a client and the server, right? So you can see basically all kinds of details about uh, the way headers should be passed, the way your proxies actually work. And in other words, if a client and the server respect the same rules, they are able to communicate uh, correctly, right? Using the, the, the rules of the HTTP protocol. Also caching, but uh, the scope of this course is not to, to go uh, deep down on the HTTP protocol because it's very, very complex um, and uh, lots of details are, are in, inside this, this particular topic, maybe for a different course in the future. But for now, we're going to, to limit ourselves to this very basic usage of this, uh, of this protocol. As a short summary, when you make a GET request to a web server, you are basically requesting data from it. When you're making a POST request, you're delivering some data to that server, right? In this case, we define a GET mapping, which means that we instruct the API, the web server, to allow GET requests on that path, right? We also have POST mapping, which means that we instruct the web server to receive data from uh, external clients on a different path, right? for example, add user. And this is what we're going to do next. So in the next lecture, we're going to continue to build this uh, user controller uh, in order to, to explore that uh, interaction with uh, external clients even more. All right, so we saw the way we can basically get some data back from our API. Now let's learn and play with this input output mechanism of Spring Boot, right? Which is the controller and the uh, mapping setup. So a really nice thing about testing with a browser is if you have HTML returned back from your application because the uh, browser will actually render the HTML. So if we say something like HTML closed and then we say body, of course, this is not, this is just for testing purposes, just to play around uh, to show you that, uh, you know, um, the browser renders the HTML, right? Uh, just any text here. So if we run this again, and reload the page, we can see that um, the text is basically rendered by the browser accordingly, right? We return uh, HTML, but uh, it gets rendered automatically by the browser. 
Now, when you have web servers, you usually transfer data in, in some kind of format like JSON or protobuf, and you don't really need this kind of, uh, uh, you know, interaction with the browser, but uh, it might be useful if you have uh, this kind of use case, you know, just returning back HTML. Now, instead of the browser, we're going to use a dedicated HTTP client, uh, which is called Postman. This is basically a tool uh, which has this nice uh, user interface that allows us to interact or test an API with different kinds of request types and different kinds of payloads that we can configure in a very easy way. So when you, when you design web service, usually play with this kind of tool to, to see how it works and to test different things. So the exact same request that we made from the browser, we can, uh, we can uh, make from Postman by saying uh, localhost 8080 followed by get user. And if you click uh, send, you can see that you get the HTML uh, ran, uh, returned back, right? Um, you can also uh, format the, the uh, response in different ways. So now let's say we want to return a string back from our API. We, and, and that string should actually be the, the JSON representation of for our user object. So let's uh, first define a, uh, a model in our application. I'm going to create a new package called model. And right here, I'm going to say user model, right? This is uh, the class for our user. And uh, inside it, we're going to have private string first name and last name. And let's say uh, we also need to provide integer some membership ID, right? Um, which is kind of a premium, uh, you know, um, platinum user or things like that. Some kind of a level in, in, in our application, uh, just to test, test things around, right? So we're going to add, first of all, a constructor. We're going to also add getters and setters for all the fields, right? IntelliJ IDEA helps us to do this really, really well. And on the controller, we're going to return a user model back, right? We need to import that class. And right here, when we return that, we, we need to say new user model of John Doe and 1234, okay? Of course, uh, we, we play with classes in real world. We play with actual objects, models. So um, for that reason, we need to, to experiment with that as well. So when we hit send on the response, we get back this JSON. So as you can see, the, the, the framework actually converted our object into a JSON. Basically, the, the our object user model got serialized into a JSON format, right? And this was done automatically by the Spring Boot framework. Now, uh, if we go back to the to the controller, we can have a situation where we need to, to return different users based on an ID, right? So for example, let's say we have here a map, private uh, map of uh, string to user model, right? Uh, let's call this user map, new hash map, right? And let's say uh, we, we add a small controller right here, public user controller. And on this map, we have two users, let's say, uh, Let's say on the user map, we add, we put, first of all, the user John, which has this uh, this model right here. And then we also put the, the user uh, Jane, for example, right? And this is Jane Doe with a um, different membership ID. So basically we, we have those two users in this map. And when we wanna get the user from our API, we wanna get it depending on the name. Right, and uh, this means that the name needs to be provided on the request. So the client should actually add here a uh, a name that can be a variable, and this one should be called username. Right, uh, this is the way you you specify on a sp uh, on a path the fact that you want to extract a variable from it. So right here on the username, uh, we need to also add it on the parameters of this method. Uh, using the path variable annotation. And here we need to specify the type of the variable and the same exact name that we added on the path, right? So when you make a request, if you say get user John, right, from the browser or from Postman, the John value will be propagated on this username variable, right? And we can use it like any other variable. So in this case, we can say user map dot get of username, right? So let's rerun this 
and actually I'm going to also hit debug and put a breakpoint right here to see that this variable gets populated properly. So the application started, I'm going to get back on Postman and I'm going to say get user.john and hit send. And right here we can say that the username variable has the value John and it will just go into the map and return the actual um, object, right? So I'm going to hit next and back we can see that we get the same thing. Now, if we use chain, we can see that the variable also got populated properly and hit um, F9 and we can see that we got the other object. So this is the way you guys basically provide some kind of uh, data to the application on the path, on the request path, so that you can uh, select different kinds of information. This can be a user ID, it can be an email, it can be anything like that. Anything that actually makes sense in your application. Now let's shift gears and play with some POST requests, which is the way a client can provide data to an application, to a Spring Boot application. So we, we want to create a user, right? We're going to say um, create user. When we create a user, we don't want to ha have anything back, but we're going to update this, uh, this contract in a second. And we're going to say here post mapping, right? Because we want to provide some data to our web server. And that data should be the user details, right? With the first name, uh, last name, and so on. So we're going to say add user and that's it and right here on the parameters we need to provide uh, something like response request body this annotation tells Spring Boot that it needs to extract some data from the request body and put it into an object and that object should be uh, for example the user model right so this means that on the user map we can say put and we can say user dot uh, get first name followed by the actual object yeah I don't have to return anything here right right? Because uh, the, the method doesn't have any uh, return type. So in other words, I'm extracting the user model from the request and I'm putting it on this user map. Let's do this. And uh, the first time I'm going to try with a debugger to see that the user object is populated properly. Yeah, so the application started. So I'm going to create a post request. I'm going to make a new tab here in Postman. And I'm going to select here post, right? I'm going to say add user. And right here on the body, I'm going to say a raw and I'm going to select JSON, application JSON. And right here I need to provide a JSON which contains the actual information for the user that I want to create. And that JSON should follow the schema of that object, of the user model object, right? So it should contain the first name, last name, and the membership ID. I can simply get them from the other tab. And of course, I'm going to populate them with different values. For example, Daniel Craig. And this should be a value like any integer that we want, okay? So if we click on send, we can see that we got an error called internal server error, something happened. Let's see what happened. So if we go right here on the logs, we can see that cannot construct instance of user model, no creators like default constructor exists. So this is an error that you can probably see uh, pretty often actually if you play with objects, with serialization, deserialization, things like that, which actually tells us that um, when you provide this JSON, right, and Spring Boot receives that JSON, it basically tries to create a user model object, right? But when it tries to create this user model object, it doesn't use this constructor, right, which has those three parameters. Instead, what it expects, it expects to have a constructor with no parameters, to just create the instance and then it, it expects to use the setter methods to set all those three fields one by one. This is what actually the, the uh, Jackson serialization framework actually uh, expects, right? Uh, this is the component inside Spring Boot that uh, deals with uh, serialization and deserialization. So in other words, we just have to provide here a default uh, constructor with no parameters and it will uh, work. Creating again, uh, running again the application with uh, debug mode, right? It should have started, okay? And now going back to Postman and click on send and it says that we have a bad request. Let's see what's the error now. It says JSON parse error numeric value is out of range, right? So it looks like this uh, number that we added here is um, out of the integer range. So we just have to, to add a smaller number here, right? And now if we click on send, we can see that it works. So if we click on this uh, user parameter, we can see that it populates with the right values. And if we click on F9 to continue the execution, 
the value should be stored in the map. So if I'm using the other tab to call get user for Daniel, we can see that we got back um, the proper response. So this is how we actually add data to our API. So one thing that I want to also mention about this controllers functionality is that uh, usually when you play with microservices, you need to be able to specify the right status for your uh, interaction, for your request. In this case, we can see that we only have status 200 for all the requests that we made. This is the, the default one status 200 okay in HTTP uh, protocol means that the interaction happened successfully and everything worked well. Now you can also search for the HTTP statuses um, online and this is uh, the full list of, of statuses that are mentioned by the protocol, right? So for example, if you have status between 500 and 599, that should be a server error. Successful responses is between 200 and 299. And this will also has all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, statuses. Like if you respond with 201, this means that you created the resource uh, successfully, all kinds of interaction models that happened in your application, right? So in a, in a well-designed uh, web service, the responses and the statuses of your uh, application should reflect the actual uh, thing that happened. Uh, in your application through this uh, status code. And in Spring Boot, we have a way to, to do this in the controllers using an object that we need to return on each method, which is called response entity. And this response entity is a generic type. Uh, we can also um, add here HTTP status object, for example. And what this actually means is that we can return from that uh, method something like return response entity response entity dot accepted dot build so response entity is a, it follows a builder pattern and when we say accepted here it means that we add this http status accepted which is two zero and two on the response right and we build this object so basically now when we run the application and we uh, create a an user. So now when we go on Postman again and say add user and we provide here some data, we click on send, we can see that on the response we got 202 accepted, right? Which is the status code that we uh, added right here. This is of course for the best practice of your, uh, or, or, of your application, right? Now, same thing can be done here and all over the place in your application, right? In any controller, you should have this kind of uh, interaction. I also need to mention that uh, in a controller, you can also have other types of methods, right? Um, also managed by the HTTP protocol. For example, if you search for HTTP methods, actually this one, you can see that we got a number of methods here, right? So until now we used get and uh, post methods, but you can also have head, put, delete, connect, options, trace, patch, and those are all of them. For example, if we want to use delete, right? If we want to delete a user, for example, we just have to go right here, copy this method, say delete mapping. And right here, we need to identify the user. For example, we need to say delete user followed by uh, a username, which is again, a path variable parameter, right? Uh, so we can say here, remove followed by the username, which means that we just get the user out of our map. And when we return the response entity back, we can just say uh, deleted or not really sure if, this, if there is any status with, uh, I think no content can be used for uh, delete operations, right? So if we just uh, reload the application now, and by the way, when we uh, restart the application, which is kind of the only way for the changes to take effect, the map is getting uh, empty again. So only those two users will be added from the constructor, right? So uh, if we add some users and then we uh, stop the app and restart it again, the new users will not be in the map uh, when, when the app uh, uh, is restarted, right? Because it's of course uh, stored in memory. So let's see, we want to uh, get the user uh, Daniel back should be here. Uh, actually, no, uh, it needs to be the user John, right? So this is the user and now we want to delete it. So we want to create a new tab and say delete, right? This is the request type delete or the request method to be more accurate. And I'm going to say delete user followed by John, right? 
I'm going to delete it. It says 204 no content, which means that the delete uh, was successful. And then I'm, if I'm, I'm going to click send again to get the, the, the user join again, I can see that I don't have anything. Uh, we can also, of course, uh, reshape this a little bit to say something like if the user map contains key username, then I'm going to return it directly. Otherwise, I'm going to say um, return response entity dot not found built. And here, of course, I need to return a response entity of user model. And here I need to say response entity of, of this one. And this should be actually an optional, right? Optional of this one. Okay. So in other words, if I have the user in the map, I return the actual user. But if I don't, I'm going to return not found, which is 404, right? So let's rerun the application again to, to see this uh, functionality in action, right? So I'm going to get the user join back. I can see that I have it because I just restarted the application and the, the data populated from the constructor actually uh, is in the map. Now I want to delete the user join, right? And when I get the user join back, I can see that I have 404 not found and not 200 okay, okay? This is the way we can, uh, of course, update the, the HTTP status to reflect uh, the, the right operation that took place in our application. All right. So with that, we learned about the, the way we can play with controllers, the way we can get some data from HTTP clients, from Postman, and also the way we can get the data back in a proper way. Now, let's shift gears and talk about uh, services in Spring Boot uh, Framework.